have Kohal O'Connell with us. He's the chief executive of BMI Regional, uh, which is, as you know, an iconic brand in this region, been a familiar sight over our skies for many years. And Kohal is well known in the aviation industry and worked with a number of airlines spanning 30 years. He's got a really interesting talk for us today. He's going to talk about the different challenges in building a successful business from the ground up and taking an established brand on to the next level in its evolution. Would you please give a warm welcome for Mr. Kohal O'Connell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the company BMI Regional uh, has been around for quite a few years, but uh, as part of the change in BMI over the, the last 12 months, BMI Regional itself was sold to uh, a private group of investors. Basically, the situation we had a number of months back, or at this time last year, looking at what's going on in the industry, what's going on in the economy. Lots of bad news all out there. So you look at all of, all of the things happening in the industry, and what, what do we do with ourselves? We say, well, actually, you want to buy an airline. So the industry is challenged, the economy is challenged, but yet the belief that we had that BMI Regional could continue as a successful business was absolutely overpowering. We, we had to put a lot of effort into getting BMI Regional stabilized, getting it set up as an independent company. The purpose of my talk this afternoon is to go through with you the challenges that we faced as a business in trying to take what was an iconic brand, which had a lot of negative publicity about it because it was closing and BMI Baby was closing, how we actually brought that forward and managed to uh, turn it into what is today now a fast-growing, successful business. A little bit of background. Um, there was a company called Business Air, which was founded way back in 1987. Um, the, People, the two people who founded Business Air in '87 are actually the two people who led the consortium to buy BMI Regional back from uh, BMI. So it's some of the original people involved in setting up the company back 26 years ago are involved. BMI Regional, or Business Air, was sold to British Midland in '96, became BMI Regional. The BMI Group, as we know in this region, was sold to IAG last April. And BMI Regional, as a separate company, uh, was then sold to a company called Sector Aviation Holdings in June. BMI Baby and BMI Mainline both ceased operations in the latter part of last year. Today, I'm pleased to say that BMI Regional still flies. We're flying over 350 flights a week throughout the UK and Europe. Very quick bit of background because I want to lead more into, conscious of the time, I want to lead more into the uh, subject content. Basically, we're, our headquarters, uh, we have an office building in East Midlands Airport, and we also have our operations and engineering base up in Aberdeen. We've just around 400 staff, uh, 18 aircraft operational. We have crew bases at various locations around the UK. We have been the most punctual airline in the UK for the last eight years, and this is recorded by a company called flightontime.info. So they, they, they record uh, all of the major airlines serving the UK. We're very proud that we ha have maintained that record. Uh, we will be announced in March as the most punctual for the eighth year in succession. And in terms of product, we're not, we're not a Ryanair. We're, we're an airline that actually takes pride in the product we deliver. We have uh, complimentary catering. Baggage allowance is free. Where possible, we offer facilities for customers like fast track through the airport to bypass security. Um, we have an all-jet fleet, and basically, we're, you could call us a traditional airline. We, we're, we offer and we deliver to our customers what they expect from an airline maybe 15, 20 years ago, before all the frills, before all the baggage fees and everything came in. And it's something that we feel very, very proud of having that ability to deliver to our customers what they need. Final piece on the, on the overview where we fly. We're one of these names that a lot of people probably haven't heard about. Everyone has heard about BMI, but BMI Regional was always under the radar to a large degree. I think that network probably surprises a lot of people that there is actually an airline based in, here in East Midlands which flies that range of routes. Uh, you'll notice the, uh, the routes which are in red are highlighted as new. They've all been announced within the last four weeks. So we, we've announced new routes out of Birmingham, a uh, whole suite of new routes out of Bristol, uh, out of Bremen. We fly here from East Midlands to uh, Brussels and Frankfurt, and you can see the range of routes. So we're one of these airlines that not a lot of people know a lot about us, 
but actually we're trying to change all that. Part of what we're trying to achieve is build up our, our presence, build up our brand within the market. But it is a very extensive network uh, throughout the uh, UK and Europe. The core uh, I want to talk about is really the transition challenge we went through as an airline which was previously owned by BMI, sold to uh, private investors, and we had to convert what was part of a major organization operating as a full subsidiary of a major organization into a standalone independent unit operating in a very, very competitive airline market. So what I'm going to talk about is the, the challenge we faced, how we addressed that challenge, and what lessons we learned. And I think the, the lessons we learned, they weren't actually the sort of orthodox what you would read in a book about how to run a project. It was, there was a lot of things that came out of this project that actually we believe are worth sharing and, project, and items that are worth uh, introducing you to. I'll just very quickly just do the challenge. Basically, we were a subsidiary of British Midland. Um, everything that we did from an IT perspective, financial, commercial, support services, that all came out of British Midland in Donington Manor or in Donington Hall. Um, BMI Regional, as a standalone company, did not have any of its own IT infrastructure, financial services. There was a limited amount of commercial. So we bought the company on the, set on the 1st of June. BMI agreed to provide us with all of these services until the end of October. Once it came to the end of October last year, these services were going to be cut because BMI itself was closing. So we needed to identify what actually did we need to do. Where, where were we dependent on BMI as a provider? What, what were we going to do about that dependency? Did we need that function that was being delivered? How were we going to assess the priority? What did we absolutely need to have in place on the 28th of October? What could we live without? And all of that, we had 16 weeks to do it. The key point here is that missing, missing that deadline for us wasn't an option. We knew that the f services that we were receiving but from BMI, all of the computer services, all the financial services, all the people that delivered those services would no longer be part of BMI from the end of October. The uh, IT contracts that we were piggybacking on, they would all cease. So we effectively, if we didn't deliver this project on time, in setting up our complete independent structure, we wouldn't have been around on the 28th of October last year. So it's a sort of deadline that really, really focuses the mind. You know, it's, if, you, if you achieve it, you've got a company going forward. If you miss it, you don't. And very, very, so a very, very focused project. I've, I've listed there some of the stuff we had to go through. We were changing the name of the company or the identity and the airline code. You start up a company, it takes about six weeks to get a bank account set up in the company's name. We were starting this at the start of June, trying to be fully operational by the end of um, October, and it was taking that length of time to get our, our financial services set up. Our whole IT infrastructure, we didn't have any. You ring BT and you look for an internet line to be installed, you get lead times that just didn't work with the sort of timelines that we had. We had to identify all the systems we needed to use. You're talking here about a full airline infrastructure. Um, huge. I had a huge task in identifying what did we need, what did we have today as, as a subsidiary of BMI, could we use that system again, not sure, and we had to assess all of that. We also had new functions. Um, we have a call centre just a mile down the road there in East Midlands Airport. The call centre that was operated by BMI was subcontracted to a company in India. There was no call centre that we could actually tap into. Um, financial services all provided out of BMI, we didn't have people to do those services. The end of June, we had five people in a rented office in East Midlands. That was it. And we were trying to establish the core, the complete operation and, and take on what we had inherited and build that into a, a comprehensive airline. We also had a, a decision to make. The airline's operations and engineering base was up in Aberdeen. Uh, that's where our hangar is. That's where our operations are based. We had to make a decision. Would we actually go to Aberdeen and basically establish all of the commercial support structures in Aberdeen, or would we locate here in East Midlands? Um, we chose to set up our commercial and, and uh, finance IT operations here in East Midlands. Uh, we had to get it all up and running by the middle of October. That was, a, that was a challenge. And the majority of our staff that we had at the time actually were based up in Aberdeen. So the logical answer was sort of, let's move everything to Aberdeen. We have buildings, we have people. But 
we actually looked at what was available in the East Midlands and it was a little bit of, uh, I suppose we maybe benefited from other people's misfortune in the sense that BMI and BMI Baby being based in the region, there was a huge skill pool here in the region of people who had the experience we needed and were part of the BMI organisation that, that was being closed. We also had a lot of local people who weren't part of the airline industry but actually had the skills we needed in our administration, in our financial, our accounting sections and so on. In terms of ability to access East Midlands compared to accessing Aberdeen, it's, it's a no-brainer. East Midlands has huge uh, transport infrastructure, be it road, rail, air, and it made it much easier to actually set up our operational centre, our commercial centre here within the East Midlands region. The whole heritage of British Midland, being an airline based in Aberdeen called British Midland, didn't really ring well. And we know like, the heritage that's attached to BMI brand, to the British Midland brand, it all lives in this region. So we actually set up in, uh, you see the building on the bottom right there, that's the uh, Western Power Building in East Midlands Airport, just beside the uh, Radisson Blue. We've taken a floor in that building and we now have uh, around 52 people based there, of which 42 are newly created jobs in the region. Uh, Ten of the people we transferred across from BMI. Challenge we faced. We were, effectively, we were a new company. We had a 70-year brand. We had a great amount of heritage. BMI Regional itself was 25 years old, but we were actually a startup company. First thing we needed to do was identify the challenges. If I asked anybody here, what was your view of BMI in maybe June, July of last year, I'd say everybody would have said, it's closing, it's finished. As an airline, it's gone. One of the negatives of us having the BMI brand was actually, we weren't, but everyone believed we were. We were the, we were the part that was, that was surviving. We had to change our identity. Uh, because we were a new airline, we didn't have the partner airlines that BMI had. Um, the organisation structure, as I said, five of us sat in an office in East Midlands uh, at the end of June trying to reconstruct that, so we had to build that. Anything that we had that we'd inherited from BMI, it wasn't a process or a procedure that we would have designed, it was a process or procedure that we inherited. So it wasn't necessarily the right way of doing business, but we had to adopt, take that on board, assess it and see, can we change it to a better way? And the other aspect we had was we had a... Uh, the aircraft, we had 18 aircraft, of those 18 aircraft, seven were on leases to British Airways and Brussels Airlines. Those seven aircraft were being returned to us at the end of October. So out of 18 aircraft, end of October last year, we had seven aircraft coming back to us that we, we had no immediate plans for. So that was a, a commercial, significant commercial challenge. So what we had to do was say, listen, there's so much change going on here, we just can't you, you can't try and change what you have. You almost have to go back and say, if the level of change is so significant, actually, let's go back to square one. Let's treat ourselves as if we are a startup company. Let's see, blank sheet of paper, we, we, we had to look and see, if we were to do this from scratch, forgetting the fact that we have any infrastructure, what would we do? So we looked at how can we build a company, set out a plan for how to go forward, the steps we need to follow. How can we make it successful? What, what, what makes us different? Why do we believe that we can come into this market with 18 small jets and actually have a successful company? And there's a belief there that you, you've got to understand how do you, what, what makes you different as a company? Effectively, we adopted a startup strategy. We said, listen, let's, let's forget about what we do. The existing way isn't necessarily the best. I mentioned the blank sheet of paper. The number of times we produced blank sheets of paper during the, our, our startup and said, let's just check this again. How would you do it if you didn't have an existing way? And we had to look then at developing what actually can we do? What are we capable of doing? We're, we were a new company. We have people who are only coming together to form the nucleus of our commercial, of our strategy, of our finance. Recognize the limitations. We, we, we weren't going to change the world. If we were still here on 28th of October last year, that was the first step in success. Try to set the ambition at a level which is deliverable. Once you've achieved that, then you can build. So our first step was to set the target. Try to identify, actually, what is it we want to actually achieve with this company? What is it we do the best? Well, we have a loyal customer base. We have an excellent customer service. We have great reliability, great punctuality, very clean aircraft, very good aircraft, very good reputation in the marketplace. What do our customers want? They, what, what they tell us is they, they want effectively what we deliver, punctuality, frequency of service, onboard service, 
a good experience to work with, a nice experience on board, hassle-free transit through the airports. So there's no point in throwing all that away just because we're a new, new owners coming into a company. What do they want? What makes us different? Where are the opportunities for us? Well, decisions that BMI Regional would have made this time last year might have been made in an office in, uh, in Donington Hall. But that then would go to BMI Mainline for approval, and then it would go to the shareholder in Lufthansa in Frankfurt. So where are our opportunities? Well, actually, we can make decisions very quickly. That was one of the biggest opportunities we had. We, we control the company. We control their own destiny. We can decide what we want to do, where we want to bring the company. What are our constraints? Well, our biggest aeroplane of 49 seats. We're never going to compete with Ryanair. We're never going to be up there with the big guys, you know, selling seats for Tuppence Hapney. We're different. We have constraints. Recognize the constraints. People can have massive ambition to bring companies forward really quickly. The risk of doing that is you trip up very quickly as well. Understand what your constraints are. Identify then what sort of company do we want to be. We want to be a company that everybody, the priority for me is that everybody who works for BMI Regional should be proud of working for BMI Regional. Full stop. Once everybody's proud of the company they work for, well then, that means the job they're doing, they're motivated in that job, they're delivering what they feel is what the customer wants, and it gives a great buzz around the place as well. The, the, the motivation of people within BMI Regional to actually deliver what the company wants, to be proud that we're still there, it's, it's, it's a really, really enthusiastic organization right now. But for me, it's a company everybody should be able to be, feel proud of. What business model? To a certain extent, the aircraft type we fly dictated the business model. Um, as I said, we, we can't be the taking on the Ryanairs. We can't be in there looking for two or 300 people a flight. We've got 49-seat airplanes. That's as far as we go. That dictates that smaller aircraft means you can do a higher frequency on routes. If you do higher frequency, that means you're driving into more business traffic. But as well as that, if you get the business traffic right on your, on your operation and you fly to the right destinations, the leisure traffic will follow as well. But we, we knew exactly that the model we needed to follow was not hugely distant from the model that BMI Regional itself had followed previously, but we needed to make some changes to it. Understood where we wanted to go, so how do we build it? Get the right people into the right roles. Um, we were very, very fortunate here in East Midlands that we were able to tap into the people who had a lot of experience with BMI Mainline and with BMI Baby. There was a lot of people available. We interviewed a lot of people back in July for roles in BMI Regional. And you get a sense when you talk to people if, if they share the same motivation, the same sort of sense of, this is a challenge, I'm really up for it. And you get that. That comes across in interviews, it comes across in discussions with people. We, we said yes to a lot of people and pretty much everybody we took on this in July of last year is still with us. But make sure you get the right people. The, the one thing about getting the right people is believe in, what they, believe in their strengths. If somebody has 25 years experience of doing something, don't try to second guess them. They, they, their strengths are that they're good at what they do. It's very easy as management to, to turn to somebody and try and second guess, would you not do it this way, would you do it that way? Don't try and better them, believe them. You've brought them in because you believe in them. Give them the ability to work forward. Give them the ability to actually prove to you that they are actually the right people for the role. Looking at the, uh, the project, um, plan, plan and plan again. Like one chance. We had one chance to get this right. If we missed our deadline at the end of October, I wouldn't be stood here today. Um, so I can't emphasize, put the planning in, identify the gaps, where are the risks, where are the areas you just can't, you can't fill. Separate out nice to haves and need to haves. Absolutely fundamental when you're, when you're looking at any sort of tight project. What do you need to have to be in business? We were very simple. We needed to have a safe operation. We needed to have an operation that we could sell. And we needed to have an operation that was going to operate smoothly during, during the initial days of being independent. Everything apart from that, we put on the shelf. If something didn't deliver to the ability to have a safe operation and the ability to sell that service, those services, it was shelved. That's the reason why, I hate to say, we don't have web check-in working yet. It's almost there, but we had to, like a lot of airlines would say, it's one of the hygiene factors of an airline. You must have web check-in. Unfortunately, we hadn't got time to do it at the time. We're, we're going to be rolling that out now in a couple of weeks. But you have to sort of cut your cloth to suit the timelines you had. Get the third-party dependencies aligned. It's all very well having a huge bunch of motivated people within your company trying to move forward at a, at a rocket pace, and you've got one company that's a supplier to you. 
be it your telecommunications company, be it the company that's providing some of your IT services. We, we had to sit down with companies and say, listen, this is unusual, guys, but our deadline is the end of October. And they turn around and say 2014 or 2013, and you say, no, it's like eight weeks' time. And you had to get those companies on board. We, we rejected business relationships with a number of companies because they weren't confident of achieving our deadlines. We had to do it. We had no choice in the matter. Challenge and encourage ideas. Again, you're creating a new company. That's a great time to sort of get people to feed in. What do you think we should do? What, what do you feel about this? Get, you've got a good team around you, building around you. Try and get, their, get them to, in, to interact and give their views and opinions. And again, I come back to this a few times, realistic opportunities. Whatever you pick as what you need to do, you've got to be able to deliver it. So we went through all of this process trying to start the project moving. This got us into about middle of July. I got my IT manager only started on the 14th of July. You know, this, this is the sort of timelines we're working. We had no IT movement until that stage, uh, end of October, the deadline. So we started the project, and then we said, okay, when the project is running, how do we actually make sure that we're doing the right things during the running of the project? Track and track, but don't make project management a burden. I've been so many projects where you have your morning prayers with the project manager for an hour and a half every morning. Your key people are getting tied up, measuring, monitoring, where's your... Mo you know, you, what, you, what we have to do is just get it right. Are things on schedule? Yes. Great. Are they behind? Actually, they are. Well, what are we going to do about it? But this you know, continual updating of Gantt charts and so on, it has its role. But in certain projects, you have to sort of sidestep some of that to make sure you can bring forward the project rather than having very nicely produced project plans that at the end of the day have delayed you from delivering. The um, time is precious. I mean... Uh, the de our deadlines were there, every deadline in a project is there for a reason. So the idea of how do you manage people's leave? We were going through the summer, people wanted weeks off, they wanted holidays. You've got to be very clear, you know, if our, one of our guys who was on the revenue side, he went on holidays to Portugal for two months, or for two weeks I should say, brought his laptop with him, gave him a dongle, he was online every morning. It was just a compromise that had to go in. People just couldn't be away for long lengths of time with such a tight deadline. Watching the budget, great, absolutely, CEO loves that. But spend today to be here tomorrow. There's no point in withholding spend back in August on something that was critical for the project. If we didn't spend back in August or September, project may not have been delivered. So there's, you're almost backed into a corner with a lot of suppliers and saying, your deadline is so tight, here's the best deal I can do, you go with it. But really, you, you've got to take that approach of, if I don't spend this now, it's going to challenge the project. Sorry, we can't afford that. Let's do it. Right people doing the right things. Says itself. Avoid burnout, but respect deadlines. Again, this is an individual issue. This is, you're talking about people, you're talking about people's lives, their holidays, their time with their families. People need to balance their time. But at the same time, you're there with the big stick saying, we have a, we have a deadline we've got, to, we've got to achieve. We tried that. And we, we actually, by letting people take a little bit of time out, it's amazing the feedback you get, the, 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 the payback you get for that. Be realistic if deadlines are challenged. If somebody comes to you during the project, and, and we had this a number of times, and said, listen, this just isn't going to happen, I, it's, it's too tight. There's no point in you just banging the table and saying, you've got to make it work. If it can't be made work, recognize it, reflect it, and react to it. The quicker you react to realizing a deadline can't be achieved, that's the quicker you'll, you'll solve that problem. And monitoring the third parties, this, this was a huge one for us, checking with all the third parties who were involved in delivering our, our services, are you still on track, are you ready? Last thing you want is three days before you're supposed to switch over, key supplier rings you and says, oh, this has been in trouble since September. And you go, no, just keep, keep in touch, keep the contact going. Then get into how do we deliver the result. Um, this gets into the area of deadlines and how you treat deadlines, how you manage expectations. We had a deadline, but in the run-up to that deadline, we had certain delivery dates. We had hoped to go on sale at the beginning of October for flights at the end of October. It became very clear that wasn't going to happen mid-September. We had to keep pushing it. So when do you actually say, enough is done, we're willing to take the risk that we believe the project has reached such a stage, let us say switching on our booking, um, our booking engine. When is that? When are we ready? You may have to make compromises. You may have to jump the gun and say it's 95% ready. 
go with it. Um, keeping the public informed, we had a public eye on us. Obviously, people were very interested in what was happening. Um, but don't overpromise the dates. We, we were saying by the end of October, we will be operating as an independent airline. We didn't go into any more detail than that because you create expectations among the public, you miss that expectation, and being a company which is perceived to be in its infancy, you start not delivering what you tell the public and it starts reflecting badly. So we had to manage very, very carefully what we were expecting or what the public were expecting. But whatever the public are expecting, the staff have to know. So keeping the staff informed, a little bit of communication goes a huge way and we, 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 we find that in our company, I'm sure you find that in your own companies. Once your staff believe that you're telling them everything, that they're, everything that they're entitled to know, it works and it does keep them motivated. So we kept staff informed of what was happening. So many staff were involved in the project anyway that they, they knew what was happening almost by default. I put in a soft launcher at the deep end. Um, gradually maybe rolling bits and pieces of the project out to the public view, it works. Uh, we went with, um, we, we rolled our booking, our call center opened on a Saturday, but we didn't put our booking, our web booking engine out for another five days because it wasn't ready. But it gave a, a rolling sort of implementation of what we were trying to achieve. The external pressures, again, this is all about, can this be delivered um, exactly as we want it? The external pressure may say, you know, we, certain companies may not be able to deliver exactly to your needs, so what do you do? Well, actually, we're going to compromise. We're going to have to change what we're going to deliver. Tell the world when we're ready. And we did. But we, we didn't have the infrastructure to do it very well, but we, we began tweeting, we began going out on Facebook, we began sending messages out. We ran a major advertising campaign to try and tell people that we're there, we're ready. Final part is when you actually have gone live and told everybody, well, you've got to make sure it works and that you're monitoring it continually. We, we had a lot of issues with our booking engine, with our, both our web and our call center booking facilities over the first um, four or five weeks after going live. During November, was, it was a challenging time for us because we, we, we had uh, a lot of the systems that we had put in place. There was teething issues. You'll always have teething issues. But particularly the way that we went live and that we ran the project, we were very, very tight on timelines we had to make certain compromises. We tried not to make compromises that were in the public view, but at the same time, the certain things, if, the, if you have a problem with your website and people are trying to book through it, it's evident to everybody. So we had to continually monitor, and we put a lot of effort, a lot of time into, into monitoring it. Then get finally down into the fine tuning. So we're now into November, everything is settling down. Our first flight went on time on the 28th of October. We, we're now operating as a totally independent airline. So is everything working? Within certain limits it was. The essential parts were working. Today, pretty much everything is working. It takes time to bed it in, to fine tune it down. How does it compare to before? Well, actually, it was very different. Because when we were part of BMI, we had a multi-million pounds marketing budget. Everything was out there. We were selling as part of BMI. We were linked with lots of major carriers in Europe. Um, it was different. Would, would, did we expect to see a drop in our passenger numbers? Yes, we did. We saw that as part of our challenge, part of our challenge to rebuild the company. And you saw from the route map earlier, there's a lot of new routes out there, specifically driven as part of our reaction to the change we anticipated within the building. What are we learning about the market? Well, you treat the market right, you treat your customers right, and you will build loyalty. You've got to learn what the market will do. You're trying to determine how does your customer see you? Are you part of their business? Are you part of their leisure? Are you part of their holiday? We like to sort of look at ourselves for certain customers, we're part of their logistics chain. We're, we're, we're the airline that gets their people to where they need to be. Um, we want to keep that sort of cooperation going with customers, but we learned a lot that a lot of customers were exceptionally loyal to us, even though we had changed ownership. And we're now building on that and building it. What's left to be done? Well, I mentioned web check-in is almost there. Uh, we haven't got our frequent flyer program in place. That's being rolled out as well in, in the coming months. So. We left a lot on the shelf, but we had to until we had time to come back to it. We're now doing that. Um, how do you prioritize fixing against development? Well, in my view, fixing is something that's causing your customers a problem. You've got to do that before you go developing, and that's what we spent a lot of November doing. So trying to make sure that any bugs you find, you've got to resolve, be they on IT systems, be they on the way we deliver product on board. One of the biggest, biggest challenges was moving the company from being a company in transition 
to actually business as usual. For BMI Regional last year, the first six months were all about, will the company be here? Because nobody had bought the company. It was for sale. IAG were saying they would close it down in October if nobody took it on. Um, so the first six months for the staff were very much confusion as to what's going to happen to the company. Will, do we actually have a company? Second six months were a group of people coming in and saying, okay, we now have the company. We're going to um, make it a successful, profitable airline. But that's going to need a lot of change. So we went through six months of being in transition. To be very honest, the, the six months from June or July to December, we were almost operating as an IT company. We were developing, we were fixing things, we were getting our systems and structures and everything in place. We really hadn't got time to focus on running an airline um, other than continuing what we had in place. Um, so we had to move to business than usual. We had to sort of say, okay, let's forget now, let's put transition behind. We came in at the start of January, and the first thing we said at the start of January was, let's forget everything that happened last year. We now have what we have. There's no point looking back and saying we should have done this, or we did that right, or we did that wrong. It was to look forward and say, how do we actually go forward with this company now as an airline? So what we've successfully done at this stage is we put the project behind us, got to run the airline and try to make sure that really what we've, what we've delivered, we feel very, very proud of what we achieved in the latter part of last year. A lot of industry observers said there was no chance we would do it. We achieved it, warts and all, we delivered it. We got through um, the transition after, the, uh, after we went the end of, uh, end of October. And uh, we've now got an airline that is beginning to actually grow again. It's a little bit like see the daffodils beginning to appear out in, out in the gardens now. We're beginning to grow. We're beginning to see here's what we can do with this company. We're getting fabulous reaction from our customers. We're getting a lot of traction on our new routes and what we're doing. So we're really looking forward to the future. And we, we, we see BMI Regional as being a very, very, um, hopefully a very, very successful airline going into the future. Also playing a major role in helping businesses to do business. And that's one of the core issues we want to try. We want to be part of for business passengers, we want to be part of their business process, part of what they do, to, what they do um, in their travel, how we can be part of that to help them do business. So um, that's just a very brief um, introduction or overview of what we, we've gone through. Hopefully it was useful to you. Uh, we believe we learned a lot during the, uh, the whole project. Uh, if anybody ever wants to go into any more detail, I could spend months and months talking to you about it. It was a very intensive period during, um, during the life of the airline. Uh, very, very challenging, some really, really good people on board and uh, fortunately we came out the other end as an airline which is now growing and growing very quickly. Thank you. Kahalo O'Connell there, Chief Executive BMI Regional, thank you so much. I just said to him he was bang on time, he said that's what we try and do. So, uh...